All right, so uh, I'm going to talk about popular conjectures, which most of you uh, have seen which popular conjectures I mean, and dynamic prog problems. And uh, what's a dynamic problem? You have some function you want to compute, and you, you're given an input on this function. You compute this. You compute the, uh, the result, and now, one at a time, people start giving you updates to the, to the input. So this bit changed, that bit changed, and while they're doing these updates, they can also ask you queries. What is the output of the function right now? Okay? And this is a dynamic problem, and um, one trivial way to solve dynamic problems is to recompute the function from scratch. Every time a bit changes, you recompute it, or you can, even, or you can recompute it at query time. And the central question of dynamic uh, algorithms is when can you do better? When can you substantially improve on the brute force sort of way of recomputing everything from scratch and for, on what problems you can save substantially? So let me begin with uh, a plan. So the plan is going to be I'll give you some overview of various little conditional lower bounds we've proven. And then I'll show you, again, some very simple proofs. And I'll, in the end, I'll talk a little bit about recent developments and if we still have time about open problems, which uh, I'm not sure we will. We'll see. OK, so here's one of the interesting dynamic problems. Your input is a graph. And your updates are uh, add and remove edges. The query I want to answer is for these special vertices S and T, are they connected in the current graph? Um, there's variance of the problem. Sometimes you are allowed, the query can ask for different pairs S and T. So they can say, for this S and T, are they connected in the current graph? Again, the trivial update time is order M, the number of edges, because after each update or query, you could just check whether S and T are connected and so on. And one of the big successes of dynamic algorithms is to show that actually you don't have to do order M. You can do polylogarithmic, in fact, roughly log M time per update. Uh, and this is actually very nice because there's also a cell probe lower bound by Petrashko and Domain. They show that uh, log M is necessary in the cell probe model. Okay, good, this is a big success. Now, consider the directed version of this problem. Now, instead of an undirected graph, you have a directed graph. Again, you can add and remove edges as the updates. And there's two t different queries maybe you want to answer. One of them is just like in the previous slide, uh, are two fixed vertices S and T, uh, can you reach T from S? And the other version is you just fix uh, one vertex S and you want to know in the current graph, how many vertices can you reach from S? We call that problem uh, number SSR, anyway, number of reachable nodes. Okay, so again, the trivial thing is you recompute what you want to answer in order and time. You can save something if, you, uh, if your graph is dense enough and you use matrix multiplication. But the best cell probe, probe lower bounds we have is, are still logarithmic. Okay, so there's a huge gap between what we can do and what we can prove. Uh, and so this is not great. And we want to do something about this. And all right, this happens for many problems. You can build a huge list here. here this is some sample. So besides reachability, maybe you want to maintain the, num the strongly, strongly connected components of a graph. Maybe you just want to know their number. Maybe you want to know if the number is bigger than two. Okay, it's various variants of this. Uh, maximum matching, maybe you want to know the size of the ma maximum matching. Maybe you want to know uh, some approximate matching. Uh, then there's a, a, the con connectivity problem. Just like on the first slide, graph connectivity, you want to know when U and V are connected. But now your updates are not edge, edge insertions and deletions. Instead, uh, the, uh, the updates are node insertions and deletions. Here, the best upper bounds are order M, order M. If you want to approximate the diameter, say I tell you, 
uh, give me a four-thirds approximation of the diameter and of a graph under edge insertions and deletions. The best thing we know how to do is compute all pair shortest paths after each update. This is crazy. Okay, it should sound crazy to you. Why, why should we have to do all this work after every update? I don't know, but the best lower bounds are get log error. And it's a huge, huge difference. So today I'm going to talk about how, assuming various conjectures that we've seen so far, you can actually prove some tight lower bounds for these problems. OK, so let me start with uh, a paper uh, by Petrashko from Stock 2010. He considered the three-sum problem, which I defined in the first uh, lecture. So here you're given n integers, and we want to know if three of them sum to 0. We, don't, we have a simple n squared time algorithm, and there is a conjecture, the three-sum conjecture, that you can't do much better. So n to the 2 minus epsilon for epsilon bigger than 0 is probably not possible. If you assume this conjecture, Petrashko's paper shows that you can show, you can show some polynomial lower bound on the update time for problems such as the ones I mentioned on the first slide, for the directed reachability problem, for how many nodes can you reach from a source, and for the undirected connectivity problem when you have node updates, and many other problems. So this said that um, no polylogarithmic update times are possible if you believe threesome. So you will have to pay some polynomial time every time you do an update. Okay, so then uh, two papers looked at uh, Petrashko's paper, tried to optimize the parameters to see if you could push this m to the a to something more meaningful, and we got m to the one third. So we get a threesome lower bound for the update time for all these problems, which is roughly m to the one third. And for some reason, some technical reason, we couldn't be on we couldn't go beyond m to the one third. Okay. And uh, so we were kind of stuck. So then we thought, well, maybe threesome is not the right problem to reduce from. Maybe one of our other cool conjectures could explain why these problems are difficult. OK, so then let's consider this uh, combinatorial Boolean matrix multiplication conjecture that there is no n to the 2.99 algorithm for Boolean matrix multiplication, so combinatorial is not well defined and so on. But let's, uh, let's consider this. And if we prove some lower bounds for this problem, it will mean that any algorithm would have to use some form of fast matrix multiplication. Okay, if you assume this conjecture, then all these problems require m or the omega of n time per update if you, uh, if you don't use fast matrix multiplication. OK, so now we're in this very nice setting, except we're losing something because of the com combinatorial business. OK. Uh, however, a follow-up paper by Hensinger, Kroeninger, Nanun Kai, Saron Murak, whose names are hopefully I pronounced properly. Some of them are here. Um, they show that actually if you assume um, a different conjecture that is not about a combinatorial algorithm, then uh, these lo most of these lower bounds also hold for, uh, for non-combinatorial algorithms as well. So let me define this problem and the conjecture. So uh, the online matrix vector problem is given an n by n Boolean matrix and let's say n Boolean vectors that are given in an online fashion. So you get v1, v2, and so on. Then after the moment you get vi, you have to output the product of a with vi. Okay, And you have to do this for all of them. And uh, so clearly, every time you get a vi, you can also do the product in n squared time. So you could, do, uh, you could solve this problem in n squared worst case time per update, per query vector. Uh, Ryan, in 2007, said, well, uh, let's pre-process the matrix. We pay just a little bit uh, and to the epsilon overhead over the size of the matrix. And then, after you do this, now the products take uh, n squared over log squared time. 
instead of uh, n squared. And this is worst case time. Every time you do a matrix vector product, you get some savings over n squared. OK, but then why can't we just do n to the 1.9? And we don't know. What if we relax this worst case so it's now amortized? So sometimes the matrix vector products could take a long time, but on average, maybe they will take very little time. OK, so and again, even if we relax this condition, the worst case condition, we don't know how to do better than essentially n squared. So this motivated this conjecture. The, the conjecture is that this, this problem requires essentially n squared advertised time. And notice that, so if you believe that Boolean matrix multiplication doesn't have n cubed, less than n cubed algorithms, you should believe this one. Uh, this one says nothing about combinatorial algorithms, uh, but it allows you to prove basically the same sort of results that the Boolean matrix multiplication uh, problem allowed us to do because uh, because the way we did things anyway, we were, we were solving Boolean matrix multiplication by just solving matrix vector multiplications. So, if, so then many of the lower bounds transfer. OK, so there were attempts to prove this conjecture. So re a recent attempt was to show a lower bound in the cell probe model. Here you fix a very large finite field and, and some space usage S of your data structure. And then you can show the following lower bound n log of the size of the field times n squared. This is only meaningful when the size of the field is large. So you can get something that's super linear then. Okay. But it's not it's not what we want. But it's getting there. Yes. Ah, Clausen, Gronlund, and Larson. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is only when the space is linear. Only. Uh, this is the instantiation of the result when the space is linear. Okay. Uh, they have a more complicated expression for arbitrary space, but the the bound is most meaningful for this scenario. Otherwise, it's much lower. Good change. represent a matrix uh, this is overhead on top of the matrix um, oh okay you, you can store the matrix and then on top of it you, you store this okay, great good okay uh, all right so this is the uh, online matrix vector problem in a conjecture and now what we can do we can add this conjecture to many of these problems here um, and now we get M and M, and this is this is great. Except now we added a new conjecture. And okay. Good. So now it all looks good, but what about this bizarre I issue here? If we want to approximate the diameter, we the best algorithm we know is just to to recompute all pairs short as pass from scratch. And here we only get a linear omega of n lower bound. And so maybe there's a completely different conjecture that explains this. Okay. This motivates uh, bringing or strong initiation orthogonal vectors to the dynamic world. So here, let me just recap again in case you weren't here in the previous few talks. Strong ETH says that there's some for every epsilon there's a case, there's a case that can't be solved in two minus epsilon to the n time. And orthogonal vector says, if you're given a set of n vectors of d dimension d that's slightly uh, super logarithmic, you can't solve it in uh, less than n squared time, essentially, poly, log poly of the dimension. OK, assuming this is true now, you can prove the following. You can prove that these problems require uh, omega of m time, just like these conjectures said. And on top of that, uh, approximating the diameter better than 4 thirds, this is what this means here, requires omega of m in time per update. So we can prove pretty strong lower bounds just assuming for uh, these conjectures. Now I'll actually show you the proof of this in a bit. It's not too bad. OK. Uh, 
Yes. This four conjectures or five conjectures, they're still independent to each other? As far as we know, and there's some, uh, so they're probably maybe independent, and there's some attempts to proving this. Uh, they go close, get close to that. Yeah, they could be independent. And actually, at the end of the talk, I'll show you that there's a conjecture that's, uh, that uh, is strictly most, more believable than all of them that also implies all these things. And that's um, basically, it's a conjecture that the conjecture is that at least one of them is true. So it's <laughs> OK. <laughs> you see. Uh, all right. So the point of all of this is that sometimes different conjectures are better for explaining different barriers. And often you, what you have to do is look at your problem and sort of think, what does it structurally resemble? And then if, once you figure that out, it's uh, usually not too bad in finding the reduction. But the tricky part is figuring out which of these conjectures you can use. And sometimes we, you have to add a new conjecture. OK. Now, besides these problems, there's various other problems that we can't prove lower bounds to, in particular, some weighted problems. And so then we can assume the all pair shortest pass conjecture. There, uh, we say that all pair shortest pass cannot be solved in n to the 3 minus epsilon time for any epsilon that's a constant bigger than 0. And now, if you assume this, you can add more problems to the list. For example, you can add the, the problem where you're given two fixed nodes, S and T, and you do edge updates, and you want to know uh, what is the current distance between S and T. So that's, that's that. And uh, all pair shortest path says that uh, this problem and also the maintaining a maximum weight matching in a graph require n squared time per update. And the trivial algorithms for both these problems running n squared time for dense graphs. So, so that's, that's what we can show. Now, uh, again, different conjectures are better for explaining different things. So we didn't know originally whether you can prove such a result from strong TH and the other problems. But now we know a little bit more, so we'll get to that later. OK, questions at this point? Shortest pass conjecture is for dense graphs, right? Yeah. So what does that mean for the? Yes. So uh, I'm sweeping a little bit under the rug, actually. Okay. This m is n for sparse graphs. Um, this n squared is for dense graphs. Okay. So uh, you can also only really prove this for dense graphs. So it doesn't say if you can do this slightly better for the sparse graphs. And, uh, I'm sweeping something under the rug, but uh, it's it's close to what what is true. You can make all pair shortest path conjecture for sparse graphs too. Yes, you can, but the reductions have to change the way we have them because we go. Yeah, we can we can have a conjecture for sparse graphs that all pair shortest paths requires uh, omega m n time for graphs that well okay uh, m n to the one minus epsilon for. All epsilon, but uh, we, the reductions we have uh, will be more complicated because, for as we saw two lectures ago, uh, for dense graphs we can say that all pair shortest pass is equivalent to a negative triangle, which is a very simple problem to reduce from. But for sparse graphs, we don't have such a simple problem, which makes things harder. All right, so we finished the overview. And what I'll do now is I'll give you very, very short and simple proofs. It will be very similar to uh, what we've seen before, except in the dynamic setting. And hopefully you'll see how, uh, uh, how these proofs usually go. And then we'll get into the recent developments. OK, so let's uh, revisit this problem of single source reachability. We'll consider the version where you're given a graph and a fixed node S, and you want to maintain the number of reachable nodes from S, and you can insert and delete edges. Again, the trivial algorithm says whenever an edge is inserted or deleted, you just recompute the reachability set from S in order and time. If you assume the online matrix vector multiplication conjecture, you can prove an omega square root of m update time. 
and we showed that uh, under strong ATH and orthogonal vectors, this problem can be solved in this much time, in m to the 1 minus epsilon time, so it's an almost tight lower bound. Here's how the reduction would go. Uh, this is the outline, and then I'll give you the, the actual thing. So you're given the orthogonal vectors. Let's assume we split the, we just have two copies of the set, and now we want to find a vector here and a vector here that are orthogonal. So now uh, we will build some instance of this dynamic problem. And this instance will have n times d edges. d is the dimension, n is the number of vectors. This many edges, n nodes, so it's very sparse. The number of updates we will perform it will be roughly the same as the number of nodes and edges. And the same holds for the number of queries. Suppose we had an amortized m to the 0.9 update and query time. Then uh, we plug in n d over here. Uh, D essentially goes into this tilde, and we get that we can perform order N D updates and queries in N to the 1.9 time. And then, uh, because of the, the, the way the reduction go, went, we get the orthogonal vectors in, in N to the 1.9 time. So this is the, the way we'll do it. Now let me show you uh, how we do it. Um, all right. So here the, the vector instance. We'll build this graph. Th these are nodes corresponding to the dimensions of the vectors, the u1 to ud. We have a single source s, which will be the source for our reachability questions. And here we'll have these n nodes that correspond to the vectors. Uh, we'll hardwire the static part. So we'll, first we'll, pre we'll add these. This is the initial, initial input to the, to the problem. So what we'll do here is we'll put an edge from a dimension node uh, i, let's say, to a vector node here if the vector is one in that dimension. So here, uh, this, this corresponds to the blue edges. Whenever bi is one uh, in dimension j, we'll put an edge there. OK, and the edges go from left to right. Okay, so this part will be static. We won't be changing it. The only thing we will do is we'll add edges here and remove them. Okay, so here's how we add and remove edges. For every vector, um, when it's time to ask a query about it, at each step we'll ask a query whether there's any vector orthogonal to AI. Okay, so whenever AI comes in to be, for it to, uh, to ask about, We'll put an edge between S and a dimension if AI is one in that dimension. Okay, and then after we insert all these D edges, at most D edges, we'll make a query to ask how many nodes are reachable from S. Okay, and then you have this observation that we've seen before. Um, S cannot reach some vector B if and only if AI and B are orthogonal. And then um, what do we do? Well, we know uh, uh, what the, how many nodes will be reachable if the vectors are uh, not orthogonal. And this will be so you can reach d vectors, the, the dimension at most. So the number of ones in A is the number of edges here. And you can reach this many nodes over here. Um, and um, n is all these. If you can reach fewer than n plus the number of ones in A, then uh, definitely there's an orthogonal vector to AI. And so you check this condition, and then you output yes if you get fewer than what you expected. If, you didn't, if it says that there's exactly this many reachable nodes, then you remove these blue edges and move on to the next AI. And you cover all of the AIs, and this is the entire algorithm. Um, it's again very simple. Okay. Good. The number of edges is n times the dimension at most. The number of updates is the sum of the number of edges. Uh, okay. And so what you get is uh, n d updates, n d query, uh, n queries, and uh, n d nodes. That's exactly what we wanted. And it, show, it reduces orthogonal vectors to this problem in kind of a trivial way. 
Okay, and this graph is always very sparse. So. Okay, so with additional gadgets and some other trickerations, you can improve lower bounds for strongly connected components, even in the case when you want to know if the num their number is more than two. Uh, again, you can you can prove tight lower bounds and direct connectivity with node updates and so on. Okay, so you know most of these reductions are not too hard. They just uh, do what we just did. Okay, so the next thing I'll show you a slightly different reduction um, that uses a, a lower bound for diameter. Okay, so the dynamic diameter problem, you're given an undirected graph, you add or remove edges, and the query is what is the current diameter? We have upper bounds. The upper bounds are, the naive ones are mn per update. You can do amortized than square time uh, if you're a little bit more clever, but when, uh, when the graph is parsed, this is still mn. So that's not very good. So what we showed is that if you assume that strong ETH holds, it's not, it's not a reduction from orthogonal vectors, by the way, it's just from strong ETH, um, then uh, even approximating the diameter with four, uh, within a four-thirds minus epsilon factor will give you uh, something interesting, even when the graph is sparse. And you have to, it will take uh, n squared time per update, basically. Okay. The previous uh, type of reduction wouldn't work because we, we couldn't prove such strong update times. We could only prove n. So we did something different. So if you look back at what Ryan's paper does when it reduces uh, strong ETH to orthogonal vectors, there's no reason to reduce it to two orthogonal vectors. You could reduce it to three orthogonal vectors instead. So now orthogonality means that when you take three vectors, um, they cannot all be one in any coordinate. So here's uh, the instance, three sets of vectors. You want to find three vectors that are not, that are mutually or orthogonal. Okay. So, and what we do is we take this and we reduce it to dynamic diameter. And uh, Ryan's, if you carry over Ryan's proof that I showed you, what you will get is that if you can solve this problem faster than n cubed time, then strong ETH fails. Okay. Okay. So the outline of the reduction is we'll be constructing a graph, again, on ND nodes and edges, and we'll do ND updates and queries. But now we're fighting against cubic time instead of quadratic. So if we get a quadratic, better than quadratic amortized update time, and you plug this ND in, you get uh, into the 2.9 time algorithm for three of orthogonal vectors. Okay. So the reduction will be a little bit similar. So what we do is, uh, for all the vectors in the set A, we put nodes, all the vectors of the set B, we put nodes, and we put two copies of the coordinates, coordinate nodes. These edges are the same as in the previous reduction. There's an edge between a coordinate i and a vector b if b is 1 in that coordinate. Same holds here. There's a vector between a and j if a is 1 in coordinate j. Okay, and so far um, the diameter is infinity. We haven't added anything. These edges will be static. We won't be doing anything to them, but we'll be adding and removing edges in here. Okay, the number of nodes is n um, plus d. The number of edges in it is roughly n times d. Okay, so now the way the updates work, whenever uh, one of, uh, at each stage we'll have a vector in the set C, and now whenever the, a vector CI comes in, we're going to put a matching between the copies of the nodes, uh, the copies of the coordinates where this vector is one. Okay, so now we have a matching here. After we put this matching in there, we'll ask the diameter query. Okay, there's an observation that the distance between an A node and a B node 
is strictly more than three, uh, if and only if the three vectors are orthogonal. Okay, so the diameter will be strictly more than three if that happens. Okay, so we query is the diameter bigger than three? If it, it says yes, then we output yes. Otherwise, if we remove all the edges we inserted here, there's at most D of them, and we move on to the next CI. If there's ever an orthogonal triple, we will catch it. We only perform uh, N times D updates, and uh, the graph is small. And this, this concludes the reduction. Again, very, very simple, but because we started from something that's not orthogonal vectors, we proved a higher lower bound. It's not always possible, but for this problem it is. It's, it's really, really expressive. So as a summary of this part of the talk, we can get some very high conditional lower bounds for fundamental problems. And after you identify the conjecture, it's often not too hard. And yes, I, I think some of these reductions are so simple you can present them in courses. So this is a good motivation to do this. Okay. So here we're back at the plan. Uh, we finished a lot of what we had. So I'll tell you a little bit about some recent things we've been proving. And if we have more time, I'll go get into open problems. Questions? Yes. So um, I think like all the lower bounds that, that you're giving don't use the full power of, of dynamics problems. They're all about um, you have some function of x and y, and you want to evaluate it on one x and many y's. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, that is true. We're not exploiting the full power. and. Uh, but this also gives us some, something. It gives us that we can prove uh, uh, lower bounds for partially dynamic algorithms that are in the worst case. But um, there's some recent work uh, that was able to use a little bit more of the power. So there, besides uh, adding and removing the edges like this, so this is a work by Seth Petty and co-authors. So they, they also increase the graph as they go along, and they. Uh, they reuse the information in a more clever way, and they're able to prove stronger lower bounds. So uh, you, it's a great question. We are not, uh, we, we could be getting much better things if we use the full power of, of dynamic algorithms. Okay. So. So there is this other conjecture, which is that, well, maybe you don't believe that all of these are true, but maybe you believe that at least one of these conjectures is true, that uh, either strong ETH holds, or um, threesome requires n squared time, or au pair shortest pass requires n cubed time. So suppose that either one of these is true, then all of a sudden, you can still prove these lower bounds. So all of these problems have linear lower bounds. Before, we couldn't prove any connection between all pairs short as pass and these problems. But now, we can prove a lower bound of n per update. That's some new, new techniques we have. OK, this threesome lower bound that used to be m to the 1 third became n. So now we have even more reason to believe that these dynamic problems are difficult because now you only have to believe that one of the conjectures is true. And we think that the, these conjectures are probably unrelated. Okay. okay, so how would you prove such a thing? The way we did it is we found simple looking problems that you can reduce all these problems to. In, this, uh, in the sense that if you have an n to the 2.9 algorithm or two, three to, n to the 3 minus epsilon algorithm for any one of these, and all these uh, problems have faster algorithms. And the nice thing is that, OK, we could have just proven this result. It would have been interesting. But now we can also reduce these simple problems to dynamic problems and also some non-dynamic problems. 
and these uh, these the uh, the conjecture that at least one of these con problems is hard implies that dynamic reachability requires essentially n time per update, and this funny thing, which I have to define, I guess, over there. Uh, it's max flow, except now you're given two sets of nodes, S and T. You can think of them as being of size square root of n. And I want to know for every pair of a node in S and a node in T, what's the max flow between them? Seems like maybe these wonderful max flow techniques that people have been developing maybe could solve this problem. But what we show is that uh, if you believe that at least one of these conjectures is true, then uh, this this problem requires them to the 1.5 time. Even in graphs, yeah. Yes. So this time, previously when you were doing strong ETH, you were doing it via orthogonal vectors. You have to use uh, strong ETH directly here. Yeah, so th this is something interesting. Yeah, we didn't, these, uh, we can't reduce orthogonal vectors to these problems. But the problem I just showed you, three orthogonal vectors, we can. So we reduce this to three orthogonal vectors to these problems. OK. I'll define the problems now. The first one is as follows. It's a problem on a graph with colors on, on the nodes. You have a, node, a graph on n nodes and squared edges, and you want to know, um, is there a triple of colors so, so that there's at least delta triangles connecting these colors with these colors? Um, now, what's delta? If delta is 1, we can solve this problem. Then the problem becomes, is there a triple of colors uh, uh, so that there's at least one triangle, which is equivalent to asking, is there a triangle in the graph? So we can solve that problem with triangle detection, becomes n to the omega. If delta equals 2, well, you can still do something, but it's, it's, the runtime becomes higher. As delta approaches log n, we don't know how to do better than n cubed. And in fact, if you could do n to the 3 minus epsilon in the regime when delta is log n, then all three conjectures are false. So this is just a static. This is a static problem, though. This is now a static problem. So yes. The, the number of colors here is not playing a role. Uh, no, it doesn't. You you could put it in there, but it's roughly n. It's proportional to the number of nodes. So, so this is. What does delta equals to mean? Oh well, this is the next slide. Good, good question. Uh, when delta is 2, 3, and so on, you can always get an algorithm that's better than n cubed. And we can define, design an algorithm with exponent that's roughly this much, depending on delta. Okay. Um, this is assuming omega is 2. If omega is not 2, then something else happens here, but it's always subcubic. We also get a lower bound under all three conjectures that's super quadratic, OK? And they meet sort of in the limit. And it says that there's these problems parameterized by the number of triangles you want, whose complexity is somewhere in here. Uh, yeah, they sort of interesting. So, so what do you mean by the lower? Oh, this is under these conjectures. Under the conjectures. It's not an unconditional lower bound. It assumes that at least one of the three conjectures is true, and then, then this holds. So now, if you uh, if you want to have a very easy to describe problem that requires a certain amount of time, you can pick one of these. <laughs> okay. So um, there's this other problem with a very poorly chosen name, but we were under deadline pressure, and then we couldn't change it. Uh, okay. So. So it's triangle collection. Again, you're given a graph with uh, node colors. And you want to know, is there some triple that has node triangles? Okay, in other words, the, do the triangles collect all the triples of colors? Okay, that, that's why it's collection. Okay, well, maybe it's collecting triangles. I, I don't know. Well, we, we can have some uh, suggestions about how to rename it. 
Uh, okay, so now this problem again, just like the previous one, you can try all triples of nodes and solve it in n cube time. But if you could do substantially better, so n to the epsilon better, then again you can refute all, all three conjectures. What about triangle three coachable? It's too long. <laughs> triangle three coachable. Triangle three, but then yeah, we really wanted color to appear in the title, I'm not sure. I don't, it's just, lots of conditions. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe if we shorten it. Anyway. Okay. So, okay, triangle collection. Um, okay. So, and uh, if we assume, uh, if we use this triangle collection problem, we can prove these lower bounds here that I mentioned before. We didn't use matching triangles, which is strange, but we use this other problem. It's more. It's easier to use introductions. So uh, why are these problems hard? I'll give you a little bit of a snapshot of, the, of a proof of one of them. Uh, so the way we, we reduce all these problems to these simple looking triangle problems is we go through intermediate steps. So strong ETH, we saw the three orthogonal vectors problem. We reduce this one to both these problems. For these uh, three seminal pair shortest paths, we actually have a lot of the work done for us. So uh, Petrashko had a nice reduction from threesome to convolution threesome, which is a problem I'm not going to define. Um, and we had this reduction to negative triangle. Um, and it, in 2009-2010, Ryan and I reduced both these problems to a problem called zero triangle. And zero triangle is given a graph on n nodes. You want to know if, with weights on the edges. You want to know if there's a triangle with weight sum exactly zero. Okay, so some papers later on looked at this problem called its love triangle, but I'm not uh, okay. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that name. Uh, okay, so zero triangle, and then we took these two problems. We developed some new reductions to prove this. If you look at the reductions, probably the more interesting one is this one here. It takes a problem that has weights on the edges, it can be polynomially big, and produces problems that have no weights. Okay, so um, again, the, it's roughly believed that this, this problem is hard because these weights can be so big and how are you going to ever solve it? If the weights are very small, you, there is a subcubic algorithm, but when they're, when they're big, we don't have techniques to handle it. But our reduction kills the weights and replaces them with these colors. And I'll tell you how we do this roughly. Uh, so just some intuition. So. The naive attempt, or it's not that naive, but it's a simple attempt to do this, is to create a gadget for every edge with some weight. And instead of having an edge, we're going to replace all the nodes with some uh, more nodes here. You can think of uh, the nodes right now representing the weights in the graph. And then you have other nodes here for node Y, again, representing the weights in the graph. Okay. This won't work yet because there's a lot of weights, but just, just hang on a moment. And then, if we did this, we could replace uh, an edge of weight W with an edge from every x to a y such that x plus the weight is y. So if we did that, um, you get that a zero, a zero triangle will be represented by a triangle. And what we do, that if we if this were to work, right, we, we could just uh, color all the nodes corresponding to a particular vertex x with the uh, with its color. Oops, or vertex u with its color. This color will just be the name of the vertex u. Now, this is wonderful, except the graph becomes enormous. Uh, we started with a graph on n nodes, and then we replaced every node with nodes corresponding to the weights. But the weights can be in the range minus n to the c and n to the c for any po any constant c. So, what what are you going to do? Um, luckily, there was this nice paper which had a wonderful name, uh, okay, uh, by Amir, Kevin, Louis, and Ryan in ESA 2014. 
they, they looked at the threesome problem and they showed that in that case you can you can sort of reduce threesome to a different version of threesome in uh, where instead of integers now you have uh, vectors and the uh, in the coordinates the vectors are very have very small integers and the dimension is also very small so now it's some version of threesome where you're given a set of these short vectors with a, do, uh, with a range in the coordinates very small and you want to know if there's three vectors that mutually sum to some target. It can be zero or some other vector. Okay, so they were able to get rid of the polynomial size integers with some very small ones by making it into vectors. And now we notice that we can actually non-trivially, but you can fix up this gadget so that all of a sudden you translate these vectors into D triangles. And D is this dimension here. Okay, And I don't have time to do this, but I can flash the slide if you want. Yes? So, just curious, uh, how is this three-sum reduction? Is this uh, Chinese remaindering uh, or uh, can you say a word how it's done? Ah, Ryan, do you want to tell tell them how it's done? Since you're an author. Oh, uh, well, one way to think about it, you split the, you split the, so think of the numbers as like C log n bit string. Yeah. You split the number into, according to this slide, order log n over log n pieces. Uh, then you, well, then we guess all the, the carries. Okay. Like, from one piece to the next piece. There's only three uh, numbers being summed, so the number of carries is there's some constant, right? And uh, right, and so then within each piece, it's like only order to log in. Like possible possible numbers, right. because the numbers are like log order to log in bits length. You, I think you could use Chinese remaindering too. Uh, it's a, you get, I think there's a little loss in it, though. That's all. Here's a statement of what they proved. <laughs> okay, for any choice of the dimension d, constant c, and n number of uh, integers, you can map the integers from minus n to the c, n to the c, to some set of vectors, which whenever d is constant, this is constant, uh, which, are, which map, so every integer is mapped to a bunch of vectors. The dimension of the vector is d, and, and every vector has entries in n to the c over d roughly size. And then you preserve this property that three sums map to uh, vector three sums. And then what we did is we, uh, we built a graph uh, for every choice of these uh, two to the order d vectors. And, and the graph will follow the same gadgetry, but I'm not, I'm not sure if I have enough time to cover it. So I'll cover it if only uh, if people are interested in it. Who is interested in it? One. Okay, not enough to do this full thing. Talk to me after that. Okay. Okay, so I'll spend just a few minutes on what's next for this approach. Uh, this was originally supposed to be two talks, but I just sort of merged them into one. Uh, it used to be three, two 30-minute talks. All right, so the first thing is we need a better understanding of the conjectures. Basically, how do they relate to each other? Can we get rid of some of them? So can we actually refute them? That would be great. Um, okay, this one was supposed to fade. Okay, uh, then maybe we want to classify some more problems. Here's some uh, unclassified problems. What about stat the max maximum matching in the static case? Can we prove any any lower bound on it? The current best algorithm, even for bipartite matching, is m to the 10 over 7. Uh, it's not linear. Can we prove anything super linear for this? I don't know. Maybe it can be done in linear time. What about linear programming? It seems like such an expressive problem. Can we prove any interesting lower bound? Um, I suspect this is probably not possible, but maybe you could try it. Uh, can we write a small linear program for orthogonal vectors of threesome? Maybe you could use, um, there's these nice lower bounds on the size of linear programs for problems, so maybe you could show that these problems don't have such small linear programs, or maybe you could write one, and that would be interesting. 
recently we decided what, what if instead of just uh, these conjectures, let's focus on conjecture for k click, and we prove some stuff about it. So if you believe that, uh, so there is an n to the omega k over 3 algorithm, which is roughly this much for k click. If you believe this is optimal, all of a sudden you prove other, uh, that other problems are hard. So this basically means that if you improve on their running time, you would improve on this sort of long-standing upper bound for k click, which would be very interesting. I think it would be nice to improve it. It's a very simple algorithm. Okay, and um, here's uh, two problems that we can reduce k click to. One is uh, context-free grammar parsing. You're given a context-free grammar of fixed size and some string. You want to know if the string can be derived from the grammar. And uh, there's an n-cubed algorithm. Uh, Leslie Valian showed an n to the omega time algorithm, actually. And we show that actually if you improve an n to the omega for constant size grammars, then k click has faster algorithms. So before Lillian Lee had shown that this is true <clears throat> when the grammars uh, can be um, very big in terms of the length of the string, but now we showed it even for the constant case, it's true. So, so this is just to show you that k click implies interesting things for very diverse looking problems. Here's another one, RNA folding. You have a string from a biological application, let's say, and you want to find a matching. So C matches G and A matches T, but C doesn't match anything else and A doesn't match anything else. And you have to draw these matching edges on top so that you don't get any crosses. It's equivalent to having a bunch of balanced parentheses, but there's parentheses of different types. Okay, and uh, we show that the uh, that there's a n to the omega lower bound for this belief, if you believe the k click conjecture. And interestingly enough, these best algorithms here are cubic. Uh, I think they should be n to the omega, but uh, we don't have a proof. Okay. Um, so Amir had these slides also. I think it's good for this community too. Um, we had these. Uh, uh, so there's a reason why you might believe this conjecture. So Ryan had an algorithm for max cut and many other two CSPs that could be solved faster if you had faster algorithms for k-click. He used the faster algorithm for triangle, but you could do it with k-click. So there's a connection between uh, uh, the algorithms here that for RNA fold, the problems for RNA folding and so on, and these problems in exponential time like max cut. So if you believe that Max Cut doesn't have a faster algorithm than Ryan's, then you should believe that RNA folding cannot be solved faster than n to the omega time and so on. Okay, and in this spirit, we would like more connections to exact algorithms. And by exact algorithms, I mean for hard problems. Okay, so we had these nice reductions from CNF facet to orthogonal vectors and problems in quadratic time. You could think of these reductions from k-click as things relating max cut and other two CSPs to this, to these two problems. What if you pick your favorite NP complete problem for which we have a certain exact uh, running time that's sort of long-standing? What can you prove about problems in the lower class? And you, again, you can formulate various conjectures here that TSP requires an and uh, two to the end time and so on, and you can just try to bring it down to some interesting problems that have been studied within polynomial time. Okay, and then you could bring this approach up to the polynomial, to the, the hard problems and try to really relate them. There has already been wor some work about on this. So there's uh, um, work relating set cover and Steiner tree, but you can go on. You can go on with all these others and try to say that they require two to the n time if and only if all of them do, or maybe there's some other thing you could do in this world. Okay? And fixed parameter tractability. We had wonderful talks about this. So um, in FPT, people care whether a problem can be solved in f of k times poly n time where k is a parameter natural to the problem and n is uh, the input size. 
why don't we just bring this down to poly polynomial time world? Why do we have to constrain ourselves to um, exponential time solvables problems? Why don't we just do it in the uh, in for n squared time problems? Maybe there's parameters for which n squared time hard problems can be solved in linear time times f of k. Okay, this would be great, and we have some example of this. Again, diameter, I seem to like diameter, okay? So we have diameter in sparse graphs. Again, we saw we have no subquadratic algorithm for it under strong ETH. But let's say the graph is special and has small tree width. Maybe we can do better. We show, well, yes, you can. If, if the tree width is small, you can get n to the 1 plus little of 1 times 2 to the k log k. Okay. Um, this is good for constant tree width. We're fine. Uh, have a lower bound uh, under orthogonal vectors and strong ATH. If you can do 2 to the little o of k times n to the 1.9, then strong ATH fails. So these are not tight, but it's, it's sort of a nice example of how you could bring this down to the polynomial time world. You look like you have a question. Well, there are two parameters, right? But say 2 to the k and to the 1.9, it, it doesn't uh, refute anything. Ah, yeah. If you had 2 to the k, not 2 to the little of k, then it doesn't refute anything, but we just couldn't bring this algorithm down. We couldn't get rid of this log k. Would have been nice. But um, yeah, so why, why not just do, do it for lower problems? Interesting. Anyway, we would love to have linear time in n. Why not? I mean, okay. And finally, uh, hardness of approximation. Uh, again, I mentioned this before. Uh, edit distance has a near linear time polylogarithmic approximation scheme. Maybe there's some PCP theorem time for polynomial time problems. It seems like a very different task, but maybe there's a way to bring that down to the lower uh, polynomial time world and try to show uh, some, some gap ampl amplification here too. So we have these reductions that seem to only care about a plus one difference between the answers, but maybe we can amplify it in some nice way. We don't know how to do that yet. Okay, that's it. Thanks. So you mentioned about low bounds for linear programming, but what is known for upper bounds? Oh, linear programming upper bounds. So there has been some recent very nice work on problems of this type using gradient descent uh, that are uh, so polynomial. So for even like just for max flow, you can get better than what you expect. But these problems have much higher running times than n squared and n cubed. Uh, I think it's uh, for max flow. I think is you solve root n linear systems on n variables or something like that. So n linear systems it's often taken to the omega times. So you might get into the omega plus a half. So it's more than this stuff here, but. Um, but in any case, why not just get an n squared lower bound? And to the 1.5, why not? I mean, just something, something non-trivial. And we don't know how to build small linear programs out of the conjectures that we, we have right now. Uh, maybe it's not possible. So. You showed us now in the last four days a bunch of conjectures, and I think all of the constructions you showed us, if you remember, were deterministic, right? Um, yes. Um, are there examples where it's um, randomized and we would like to have it deterministic because then we have to believe less? Mm, let me think. Um, so some of the things involving threesome involve some randomized hashing. Yeah, so some of these involve some sort of randomization. Um, as far as I know... Mm. Using the three sum conjecture down to numbers in the interval. Yeah, that one is also random. Okay. I don't know how to do that, that deterministically. Already. I don't know how to reduce the three sum conjecture deterministically to having a small, mm -hmm. small numbers. I only know how to randomly hash. Yeah. 
too and cute. Yeah. That's right. So again, a very good point about threesome. Yeah, that's hashing down the, making the numbers uh, down to the interval minus n cubed to n cubed that's randomized, as far as we know. Thanks.